Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Truth Nation podcast. My name's Bill Bodner. With me today, as hopefully always, until he bails on me, <laughs> the chief, Mark Garrett. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great, Bill. How's California? Listen, I bailed from California, but I don't plan on yeah. bailing from you. That's good. I'm still here. I'm still here. It's a little chilly today. You know, I don't know if I'm talking about the weather or the politics, but it's, let's just say it's a little chilly today. Hey, it's been a, it's been a minute since we talked. I wanted to tell you about a couple of things I did last week that were pretty interesting and probably we'll probably talk about at some point coming up on the show here. The first thing was I went to a presentation about the October 7th, I think it was October 7th, Hamas terrorist attack in Israel. And it was a closed door thing, not open to the public. It was attended by an officer from the IDF who spoke at it. And also there were some family members of current hostages that spoke at it. And they talked about the attack and they had a lot of video. Um, they had uh, body camera video that some of the Hamas terrorists they were, I guess I should say that some of the Hamas terrorists were, believe it or not, wearing body cameras. And that was done for propaganda purposes to be used after the attack. They were able to get some of that footage. They had closed circuit TV footage. They had cell phone footage from a lot of the victims and even some of the terrorists. They were able to get their cell phones either left behind or terrorists who were killed. It was really intense. I'll, I'll, I'll say it like that. What struck me about it, and my perspective is, I grew up in uh, a small town in New Jersey called Glenrock, 25, 28 miles from the World Trade Center. And in 2001, 11 people from my town, my hometown, died in that attack. And a pretty good friend of mine from high school died in that attack. He was working at Cantor Fitzgerald a, a firm that was in the building. And even one summer in college, I worked in the World Trade Center. I saw the tragedy of that and felt the, the impact of that terrorist attack. And what struck me about what I saw in this presentation and these videos was that I would almost classify this as not one terrorist attack, but 1,400 terrorist attacks. And why I say that is it was almost marked like a now, th these are terrorists. These are not soldiers. The, 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 just from my observations, the tactics were poor, but it was a military operation against unarmed civilians. That's what I saw. So I saw th they showed, I guess there were 1,400 people killed that day, 1,400 people in Israel killed that day. This presentation detailed 140 deaths, so about 10%. And it was, what struck me about, it was individual decisions made, 1,400 individual decisions to kill someone. And unarmed people, uh, literally just a car pulling in and opening fire on a car, killing everyone in the car, lighting the car on fire with people in it. And that type of that type of kind of barbaric behavior is something that, that I hadn't even, I hadn't seen before. I don't think really in this country, we're lucky we haven't seen it, but it, it, it I guess uh, th that's the thing that struck me the most, Mark, how it, I, I wouldn't even put it as a terrorist attack. I would put it as a string of terrorist attacks and house to house assassinations of people. Imagine if a terrorist group came into our community and started going, house to house killing civilians. That's what this attack really was. And man, it was, it was riveting. Some of the things, and, and I won't get into them, but some of the actual things they did to children, to bodies, it was just really incredible. And I hope people remember that this is a, that this is a terrorist attack and whatever political disagreements or religious disagreements or whatever you have, society can't tolerate the assassination of innocent, unarmed civilians who are, who are posing no threat. I'll just put that, I'll just put that out there on the table, Mark. And I don't know if you've seen any of the reporting. I know you've seen reporting on it. I don't know if you've watched any videos associated with it or anything like that, but 
that that's what struck me about it when I saw it was just that it it was really not one attack. It was hundreds of attacks, hundreds of decisions made to kill innocent people. Well, Bill, this is interesting, very interesting. It's very insightful because as much reporting as I have watched, uh, like so many people, obviously, I've never heard it put that way, the way you put it. I think that is an extremely important perspective and illustration of how evil this this attack, 1400 attack was um, or were. And listen, we, all, we often hear, you go back to Nazi Germany and you go back to the Nuremberg trials and individual interviews with Nazi soldiers. And it was, I was just following orders. I was just following orders. I was just following orders. Which, of course, that's a whole different discussion about wartime. But if for these Nazi officers that were executing endless numbers of innocent people in camps, and the idea that they were just following orders is repugnant, and it is, it's, it simply doesn't hold up morally from our point of view. You're following orders to commit evil? It's, I'm sorry you found yourself in that position, but you damn well better do something if you believe what you're doing is immoral. What you describe takes it to a whole nother level where these individual terrorists were committing individual, self-motivated acts of barbarism. Personal. And, they, and, and what I have seen, and I, we talked about this a little before we started, I haven't watched any of the videos. Um, I'm a big believer in, in, in the existence of evil, of pure evil. And not that it would not be educational, but listen, I'm already sold in the fact that these people are as evil as I understand, just in, in print. I get it. But the way you put it, these individual acts of terrorism, what I have seen, I've seen videos, I've seen some videos of these terrorists talking about how proud they are, how excited, how jubilant they are, how happy they were to talk to their parents about how they tortured and executed these Israelis. This is a whole different level of evil than uh, we've seen, probably maybe not at this point, thank God, in volume, but certainly at the level of, of evil and behavior. So I'm glad you saw this stuff, and I'm mm -hmm. so glad that you put it the way that you did because people need yeah. to hear what you said. And I took with me a friend of mine who speaks fluent Arabic, let, let me he, let me say this about him. Let me just say he's worked in that part of the world before. He's worked in that part of the world before. He speaks fluent Arabic. So he could, there's audio on all these film clips. He told me after that, they, and they had subtitles. And I asked him, hey, were the subtitles accurate? He said, absolutely. They were absolutely accurate. And one of the things that you just said about celebrating the massacre, it brought to mind a, a phone call. They had a recording of a phone call that one of the terrorists made back to his parents, and he was euphoric almost, bragging about how he'd killed 10 people. And it was just incredible. And his mom was so happy. His mom was so happy that he had killed 10 people, she started crying on the phone. Like th that's, so that is the evil. And just a couple other little things. I saw an ISIS flag in, in some of these people, I don't know what affiliation they, the Hamas has with ISIS. I'm not in the weeds on it, but I did see an ISIS flag. And I think people need to remember this same type of celebration that you and I talk about. There was that celebration after 9-11 mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah, so I just wanted to put that out there. Maybe you and I will talk about that more in detail at, at a later point. The other thing I did, which was, let's say on a lighter note, I assisted, so, so the TV show America's Most Wanted, I grew up watching that show, Mark. I don't know about you. Yeah. Hey, is it Same awesome? Yeah. Uh, it's coming back. It's coming back next year, I think in late January. I helped them in a discussion about profiling a, a certain fugitive. I think it's going to happen. If it does happen, I think it would be cool for us to do a uh, a program on that same fugitive and maybe release it the night the show airs or the next morning and see if our uh, listeners can't help track the, this person down because this person is 
likely here in the United States, not out of the country. And I'm sure this is a case that I'm sure after the show airs and maybe hopefully after we talk about it, we have some retired cops, current cops, and just regular people that want to do the right thing, watching, listening. I think this guy will get caught. So, so that was something that was, yeah, like I said, on a little more lighter note, it's a horrible case because someone did die in that case, but trying to turn it around in a positive and say, hopefully we can help get this person off the street and no one else gets harmed, right? Yeah, it sounds like a great idea and yeah. something that uh, everybody helping to be proud of if we can uh, yeah. bring this person to justice. So today we're going to get into so much for the potatoes, now the meat. <laughs> yeah. uh, a topic that I know uh, you and I have spoken a little bit about in the past, systemic, or the I shouldn't say... I shouldn't say it like that. Let's say the premise. We're going to talk about the premise that there's systemic racism in law enforcement and maybe even systemic racism in the criminal justice system in the United States. And I have my own thoughts on that, but let me pass it to you, Mark, to, uh, to open up the show and the discussion on this topic. Yeah. Bill, something I've talked about on, on my show, not extensively, but I have touched on it. And we've heard this for quite some time. Of course, the phrase systemic racism really became popular, you know, George Floyd, maybe going back, you know, a few years before that with some incidents about law enforcement, systemic racism, the law enforcement. And when people say that phrase or even hear the phrase, I think it's really important not just to let it pass by without giving it some thought. You have to understand what the word systemic, it means throughout, it means complete. It means in every aspect of whatever the entity or organization, institution you're talking about, that it's completely <clears throat> throughout that organization or that profession. Now, I just want to throw this out to begin with that when I say that systemic racism in law enforcement is a myth, I never intend to say or to imply that racism does not exist within law enforcement any more than I would say that racism does not exist in your local sanitation company or in the medical field or in IT or in aeronautics, you pick it. The difference between systemic and the word racism is that individuals can be racist. I guess Theoretically, any institution could be racist. But when you make that claim, you damn well better have your facts about you. Because to condemn an entire institution, an entire profession, is a substantial claim. And it can have ramifications that maybe you not, don't even consider. So let me go back a little bit about myself and my family's history. For those of you who have not heard about it, read my bio and the Leo Nation website, things like this. Just real quick, my parents, my dad, black, my mom, mixed race, born and raised in the deep south, uh, Dallas, Texas in the 1920s, 1921, 1926, respectively, my parents. So my mom was black, white, and Native American. My dad's black. And they grew up under Jim Crow. They, they grew up under codified racism. In other words, laws that were racist by definition they were based on your skin color couldn't ride in the front of the bus and you could black man couldn't eyeball white women these were codified racist policies and laws okay that's systemic that is something that's throughout in, in this case a, a community a region in the deep south in the 30s the 20s 30s 40s 50s into the 60s my parents experienced true racism, true cultural racism. But one of the things is that both my parents always taught me, you have to assess individuals just as that, as individuals. You cannot throw in someone based on their skin color into a group or into an ideology just because of this physical characteristic. In other words, even though they had been subjected to severe tangible, impactful racism, they never applied those same evil behaviors to other people. They didn't do it, and they taught me not to do it. 
having said that, we, we fast forward to where I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles doing the, the watch riots, seeing some horrific stuff. Of course, I was only a couple of years old, but I grew up there at the time where the Crips and the Bloods were born, literally down the street from where I lived in Imperial and Avalon. Mm -hmm. So no matter where you live in this country, look up Imperial and Avalon and look up Tukey Williams and the Crips, the Bloods, look up all these gangs, you'll find out I was right in the heart of that. And so in, into the early 1970s before we left that area. And I bring that up because at a very early age, I was subjected to uh, very close contact in the relationship between law enforcement and between very substantial criminal behavior. LA County Sheriff's Department, Los Angeles Police Department, and living through those riots. Again, I can't remember the riots personally, but I was there and I grew up knowing about the riots through my older brother, my siblings, my parents. And then you fast forward another 20 years and I become a member of the California Highway Patrol. And how old were you then, Mark, when, when you started with the Highway Patrol? 27, 27 years old when I went to the academy in 1990 and I was there for 30 years. But it's not, but so as we move through this, I'm working now as an officer and leader, sergeant, and all the way up to chief. I'm working for the fourth, depends on how many numbers you look and compare or whatever, but one of the largest, probably the fourth or fifth largest law enforcement agency in the country. And I'm working beside, because I've spent my entire 30 years in Los Angeles County with the CHP, I'm working beside LA County Sheriff Department, LAPD the two of the other four largest law enforcement agencies in the United States. So I had a lot of experience with and around all of these huge law enforcement institutions. And I want to be clear, did I see and hear things from or by other officers that were racist of nature, certainly prejudiced in nature. Absolutely, yes, over the time. Absolutely, yeah. But what we're talking about here is systemic racism. In other words, are the institutions or is the institution of law enforcement systemically racist? And my answer is an emphatic no. No. I can't talk about 1950 sheriff's departments in Louisiana. I can't talk mm -hmm. about 1960s police departments in, in Alabama or Georgia. I don't know. Do I know? Yeah, I'm sure a whole different at issue here. But we're living in 2023. We're not living, thank God, in 1953. Those of us who are black in, 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 in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, that's a past. My God, we don't have slavery anymore, thank God. That was a racist institution. But we have to live in the present. So the question is, are we living in a time where systemic racism exists in law enforcement? And again, the answer is no. And I want to give you a little bit of information, documentation about why I believe and why I know. First of my personal experience in the California Highway Patrol. Let me give a little bit of stats. You have a few stats about where we are now in law enforcement in some of the largest law enforcement agencies in, in the country. First of all, just going back over the last, let's say, decade or so, the California Highway Patrol, about 7,000 uniform officers, about, well, about 4,000 or 5,000 civilian employees. Again, largest state law enforcement agency in the country, one of the top four largest in the country altogether overall. And over that last decade, we've had actually, you talk about minorities, we had a Japanese commissioner. The commissioner is the highest rank in the Highway Patrol. Number one, CHP one, like a chief of police or a colonel or the sheriff in a sheriff's department. We had a Japanese commissioner. Then we had the first black commissioner. Then we had the first black female commissioner of the California Highway Patrol. Before that, we had black deputy commissioners in the Highway Patrol. Going back into the, into the deep into the early 1990s, We've had Hispanic uh, executive managers in the Highway Patrol, so forth and so on. All of these people going up to the ranks over their time as patrol officers, all the way up to executive management. In other words, executive management is the top four, the commissioner, deputy commissioner, assistant commissioners, and the CHP. 
run by minorities, many of whom were blacks in, in those positions. So just from that angle, you have to think, geez, this institution is racist. They hunt down, they kill unarmed black men by the scores, by the bushels, and it's all being led by minorities. It just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. LAPD, talk about LAPD. Uh -huh. Systemically racist, that's the claim, right? By so many of these groups, politicians, pundits, who don't know their ass from a hole in the ground, as far as I'm concerned. Let me tell you, again, you can go to different websites and even LAPD's websites, and you get varying numbers on, on these stats I'm going to give you, but they're all pretty close. They're all pretty close. So just one website that I went to, this is the racial makeup of LAPD within the last couple or few years. LAPD, 44.6, these are officers, 44.6 Latina percent, 44.6 percent Latino, Latino. 34.1% white, 11.2% black, 9.6% Asian. Why is that so important? Let me tell you what the city of Los Angeles demographics are compared to the racial makeup of LAPD. The city of Los Angeles, 46.9% Latino, almost mirrors the percentage of Latinos in the LAPD. 28.9% white, a little less than the makeup of white office in LAPD. Asian, 11.7%, as opposed to 9.6% Asians in LAPD. Pretty darn close. LAP, LA City demographic, 8.3% percentage black population. 8.3% the city of Los Angeles, as opposed to 11.2% black officers. In other words, black officers are overrepresented compared to this, the number of blacks in the city of Los Angeles. Now, does that mean that every cop is perfect and every cop is doing the right thing? No, no, no institution has perfect, perfection. But my God, if you're going to have systemic racism, just based on these numbers, and I use these big agencies like the CHP and the LAPD for a reason, it's because... They are so influential politically and practically speaking, people follow their leads. And these agencies, I didn't even get into the numbers of, of, of CHP as far as demographics, but they're similar. They are representing the people they serve. And by the way, I'm not a huge believer in that. I'm not a huge proponent of we have to have right. a certain number, exactly the percentage is mirroring the the communities we serve i'm not a big proponent of that per se if we can do that by only hiring the best people for the job i'm all for it but we should never do that to the exclusion of the best people for the job so that's my position on yeah that. and I, I think in our first show that we did uh, a couple weeks back i talked about how i looked at lapd hiring statistics around the time of uh the george floyd incident and if I'm remembering correctly, they were hiring at about at that time, like a, a, the most recent classes that had gone through their academy, 86% non-white male. So only 14% white male. Um, I think there, I think all law enforcement now is doing a pretty good job of hiring and recruiting people that look like the community. And one thing I've heard though, Mark, and especially in the drug space where I worked for 30 plus years. When you talk about that data that you just talked about, there's a desire by some to then change the narrative and say, no, systemic racism doesn't mean that all cops are racist. It means the laws are racist. So when the cops enforce the laws, I guess by definition, they're enforcing systemically racist laws. Here's the example I heard about in the drug space. Give me your thoughts on it. Crack cocaine. When you talk about the birth of the Crips and the Bloods, hey, I was working in South LA in 92, crack cocaine cases. The idea is that from a, from a pharmacology, what am I trying to say, Mark? Pharmacology? Uh, pharma Taking pharma into consider, how about this? Taking into consideration <laughs> pharmacology, there you go. Um, crack cocaine and powder cocaine are the same drug. Mm -hmm. The premise is, or I'm going to say the allegation is, that crack cocaine was just made, the sentencing was made more harsh 
because that was a drug that was dealt by African Americans. So now we have a situation where if law enforcement is arresting someone for crack cocaine, there's, you know, they'll say, no, it's not the police officers arresting the drug dealer that are racist. It's our whole system. The whole entire criminal justice system is has these racially centered flaws in it. H have you ever heard that argument or have you heard the narrative change as you've brought up facts like you just eloquently brought up right now? I hear that argument a lot, mm -hmm. honestly, all the time. That might be a little overstated, but I hear that argument a lot. First of all, let me, there's two points here I wanna address. The first one is, is the whole system is racist, the whole system. Let me be clear, because we hear that as well. We hear about the laws are racist, but, we, but what I'm dealing with here is that law enforcement is systemically racist. We hear this all the time. As a matter of fact, I think you talked about this in our, for, our first show, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the fall of Minneapolis. It, remember when I, I talked about uh, Keith Ellison, who's still the attorney general of, yes. of, of Minnesota, and even he said, there was no racial bias in George right. Floyd, that, blah, 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 blah. However, because he could not resist, he could not resist the temptation to play to his base. And he still, he made the accusation that the system is racist, right? The system, and I'm paraphrasing, the system is biased. Although he didn't use any numbers, any stats, any evidence to say that, he has threw that out there in his interview where he said that Chauvin, Derek Chauvin wasn't, didn't engage in racism as far as you could see, but the system was, right? Law enforcement was. I dispel that whole thing about, the, about laws being racist because I don't see any evidence that the laws are targeted mm -hmm. at a particular race. I don't see it. If someone wants to write in the comments, if someone has the guts to come on here and talk to you and me about how, why I'm wrong about this, why you're wrong. We would love to have that, but I just don't see where the laws are racist. Not like I, I opened this up. I talked about how the laws were racist when my parents were kids, when my parents were growing up, they were, they're not now. That's number one. Number two, the crack cocaine argument about, well, crack cocaine is no worse than powder cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as pharmaceuticals, you're 100% right. I said a long time ago that I thought that the, the, the prosecution and the arrest for crack cocaine, now again, the law didn't say if you're black with crack cocaine, we're going to arrest you, and if you're white, we're not. The law was targeted at crack cocaine, whether that was correct or not, and I'll tell you why I think that, I'm glad they fixed that, by the way, that mm -hmm. those laws changed about that. But it wasn't targeted at black people. People say, you're just going through the back door here. Of course it was targeting black people because they knew more black people use crack cocaine as opposed to white people. That may be true. The reason, in my humble opinion, that the laws for possessing and trafficking crack cocaine were so much more impactful and, and probably much more aggressively enforced than that of powder cocaine is because of the death and destruction and violence accompanying the use of crack cocaine. It was the drug of cash for the inner city gangs. This is why it drew the ire and the attention of prosecutors and judges. And by the way, even groups within the black community were pissed about the use of crack cocaine. I'm talking about other black people because powder cocaine was being sold and used in Beverly Hills and Brentwood yep. and Hollywood. It wasn't being used. It went out of style in those parts of the communities. Black people were the ones that were suffering more than anybody else because of crack cocaine and because of the violence that it encouraged, because of the number of dead people resulting from the use and the trafficking of crack cocaine. That's why I think that's happened. And so that's a brilliant Mark. point. That's a brilliant point, Mark. And I think if that goes to the, the whole an issue that I've dealt with in the drug space for 30 years, which is people forget about the victims. And when you talk about who the victims of crack cocaine were, where they lived, what impact that was having on crime and violent crime in those areas, 
if you take all those things together, then I think you start to understand why people said this is a much worse uh, issue than powdered cocaine. We need to really make a hard stand against this drug. I, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that 100%. One of the things, so, so getting away from then the the premise that the whole system is racist and, and really focusing narrowly on law enforcement, there is a lot of data out there, a lot of studies about that claim to uh, statistically support the notion that there's systemic racism in law enforcement. And what I think is you and I need to either, we either need to, there's two, only two options. We talk about the data and we either agree with the data and say, okay, there's some changes that need to be made in the profession. Or we talk about the data and we say, based on our experiences working in law enforcement, here's why this data is flawed. People need to rethink the way they're analyzing this issue because they're getting it wrong. So, so let me talk to you about some of the places where I've heard this premise pushed the most traffic stops. And you're a great person to talk about that. Pedestrian stops, stop and frisk in New York City. I want to get into that and talk to you a little bit about that. Drug cases. Hey, I think we talked about that. We'll, we'll put that on the side right now. And the other one, which you touched on briefly was officer involved shootings, fatal officer involved shootings. Probably the four areas where I've heard this premise that this, that law enforcement as a whole is systemically racist. So here's one study. In Chicago from 2015 to 2020, 61% of the traffic stops were made of African Americans, yet they make up 30% of the population. Now, I, in my mind, from a law enforcement pers perspective, I can actually hear that number and I can probably, I'm pretty confident I can articulate why that statistic is flawed. But as someone involved in traffic stops and i'm sure at highway patrol they collect uh information on who you're stopping the reason for the stop etc when you hear of a a number like that what are your thoughts on it i have a lot of thoughts on it and let, let me go back again i yeah. like going back in time because history is such a great teacher back in 1990 matter of fact it's late 80s about 1990 give or take is right when i was in the academy and, and brand new officers in 1991 Per capita death rate in East Palo Alto. Now, Palo Alto is where the, the Stanford Cardinal play. Palo Alto is an extremely affluent city in, in Northern California, the Bay Area of, of California. East Palo Alto, which literally borders Palo Alto, and around 1990 had the highest per capita murder rate in the United States of America. It was drug-fueled murder mm -hmm. it was gang on gang it was crook on crook murder and east palo alto small police force could not handle it so who did they call they called in the california highway patrol they said we need help and the chp goes in any place for the most part maybe i'm speaking out of my rear end right now maybe things have changed in the three years i've been gone but the California Highway Patrol, for the most part, will go in and not charge anybody anything to help when we're doing law enforcement mm -hmm. activities. And the CHP went in, I'm not sure of the time frame, but within a matter of probably six months or maybe a little more than that, give or take, the crime rate in East Palo Alto had stopped, had gone to almost zero. Now, I'm mm -hmm. talking about almost zero. Mm -hmm. And before the Highway Patrol went in, when they were being asked to come in, East Palo Alto is talking to executive management of the Highway Patrol. What are you going to do? And the CHP said, we're going to come in and stop cars. Proactive policing. Yeah. yeah. So I said, why? They said, listen, there's drug trafficking. It's legal weapons. It's, it's warrants. It's, it's breaking innerings. It's bank robberies. Maybe I said drug trafficking, whatever it is. Almost all these crimes involve a vehicle. Almost all of them. Yep. If, if not all of them. At, at, at the beginning, the ends, in the middle. There's a car and stuff. So the CHP said, hey, we're going to go in there and we're going to stop every expired registration. We're going to stop every no seatbelt. We're going to stop every broken tail light, friend, whatever. Now, people might call that profiling. I don't care what you call it because, Bill, you called it. Proactive policing. This is exactly what it is. If you're breaking the law, we're going to yep. stop you. Yep. And the CHP literally cleaned that city up. I don't know where it is right now, yep. 33 years later. 
But the higher patrol, and by the way, there were allegations of racism made where you're stopping because I'm black. No, I'm stopping you because you got a crack in your windshield. And by the way, I just found out you have a, a, an arrest warrant for murder out of right. Hayward. Gee, right. what, what do you know? And the crime stopped. The crime stopped. The drugs were seized. The guns were seized. The parolees were arrested, put back in state prison where they belong. But now it's California. Now you arrest them and they're out of the booking process before you get out of the booking facility as a law enforcement officer. Going to Chicago about, that's how I explain that. Look, here's yes. the thing. I have found out that over my time that you have two kinds of crooks. You have two kinds of criminals. I don't care what level they are. Mm -hmm. You have brilliant criminals and you have absolute idiots. Now, the absolute idiots are the ones that I love because they have red flags in the car saying, please pull me over for something. Yep. Look yep. at all these violations I have. And if you are engaged, if you live a life of crime, the chances are that you are going to do just that when it comes to moving a car down the street, that you are going to drive that car illegally in violation of something, asking a police officer to stop you. Now, I've never been on patrol with Chicago Police Department. I don't right. know what they see, but they're looking for violations. And if you as a criminal are more likely to drive your car in violation of some quote-unquote ticky-tack violation, that's your problem, that's your fault, not the cop looking for it. So that's how I explain maybe the disparate numbers in, yep. in between the, the number of blacks and the number of the percentage of cars stopped. I think that's an excellent explanation. And I'll add one thing to that. I think you said it. I might just say it differently. And again, I don't know Chicago like I know LA, but if I look in the city of Los Angeles right now, I know right now where the most violent crime is happening. It's at least a year ago or, or maybe in the past 18 months, it's the Figueroa Corridor. So through South LA, that, that's where the most violent crime is happening. The most shootings are happening. Who lives in that neighborhood, Mark? That's not too far from Southeast LA where you grew up. Mm -hmm. So if the law enforcement agency, whoever it is, makes the decision that CHP made up north, when th that example you just gave, and they say, hey, we need to crack down on crime in this area. There's more violent crime here than anywhere else in the city. And they come to that area and they do good policing, which is proactive policing to get guns off the street and to get people with warrants off the street. Who lives in the community? Whatever race or whatever age or whatever religion those people are that live in that community where there's high pride crime or that are coming to that community to commit the high crime, those are the people that are going to be stopped. Am I, am I wrong about that? No, you're absolutely, you're hundred percent right. That's yeah. just the way it, it's inescapable. And, and we can pretend that law enforcement should be equally distributed throughout a city or community, regardless of where the crime's happening. We could pretend that's the way to go. It is re unrealistic, it's childish, it's foolish, and it will cost lives if people engage in that kind of, that kind of deployment, so to speak. Let, let me hit you with a, a different one now. I think we, should, we have a good answer to that type of statistical analysis right now and, and why it's flawed. Here's one that I, again, I'm sure I know the answer to it, but I didn't grow up in South LA, so I'm going to ask you. A 2018 Post investigation, the murders of white people are more likely to be solved than murders of black people. There's also a strong correlation between areas that are black majority and low income and areas with the lowest clearance rate for homicides. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think I know because, go, go ahead. I want to hear your thoughts because I will plead some level of ignorance to, um, no, to the first one, but I'll, I'll, again, ignorant or not, I'll have an opinion. <laughs> Mark, I remember going to the filming of America's Most Wanted mm -hmm. back in 2006 or 2007. It was filmed in Washington, D.C., and I went and met Reverend Al Sharpton. He was going to be, he was on the show that night. And the reason he was on the show is because there was a murder in an African-American community and there were witnesses and the witnesses would not come forward. And Reverend Sharpton said, this has to stop. Mm -hmm. We have to cooperate with law enforcement. And that's what, again, I didn't grow up in that community, but 
from my law enforcement interactions with people in that community or in those communities mm -hmm. and my thoughts back to this case that uh, Reverend Sharpton was involved in, there seems to be, I don't know, there's just not a desire to help law enforcement or to provide information to law enforcement in, in, in that community. And I feel like that probably has an effect on uh, homicide clearances. Bill, when I said that I'm, I, I plead ignorant, I meant to this specific study. Oh, 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 okay. But, but, oh, by the way, I, and I, I wanted to get your take, but, I, yeah. But to me, it was still low hanging fruit because exactly what you said. In other words, go back to the 1920s and 30s mm -hmm. with the mafia, or all the way up until probably the 1980s. There are very few ethnic groups that had a lower close rate on homicide investigations mm -hmm. than the Italian mafia. Why? Because it was very point. insular. Yep. It, it wasn't because NYPD detectives or, 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 or Philadelphia PD detectives hated Italians. It's because they could not get the co cooperation from this insular community. And by the way, not only the people in the mafia, but of course, citizens who know, know, may have tons of information they were terrified to go to the police about what they saw because they knew that the uh, ramifications were likely and severe. So not too dissimilar from what I imagine happens in it, you're saying this, these low clo close rates with the black community. First of all, all almost all of the crime, in other words, almost all of the blacks who are, are killed by other blacks, by the way, and that's true for every ethnic group before mm -hmm. people start going off the deep end. Oh! Almost all whites are killed by whites. Almost all blacks are killed by blacks. Almost all Asians are killed by Asians. Almost all, all Hispanics are killed by, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. On top of that, almost all of the deaths are criminal on criminal in, in, in all these communities. It's almost all criminal. So you have a very, you have a very small chance or you have a reduced chance of getting cooperation from the people involved because it's crime on crime. It's criminal on criminal. Yeah. That's the. It's not because cops, detectives, do not want to find out who murdered the 16-year-old kid. It's because they don't get the note. All crime, almost all crimes are killed with good old-fashioned detective work, cop yep. work, asking questions. Yep. yep. And by the way, oftentimes the detectives are the same race as the victims. Very much. Well, one other area in this uh, whole, I don't know, let's, let's just call it a false premise now, I guess. We could probably do that. Fatal officer-involved shootings. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know, I, I have it. This is interesting because I have a uh, study that was done by someone out of Cal Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And this was originally done in July of 2019. Now, mm -hmm. this study actually said there's really not a racial disparity in fatal officer involved shootings. And, and, and again, I'm telling you where that study came from, Cal Berkeley. They said there's not a racial disparity in shootings. And I'll get into the, the reasons why they said that. They feel like uh, some of the statistical analysis that was done to show that the rate is flawed. But here's what's interesting. In July 2020, guess what happened to this study? They retracted the study. Why did they retract it in July 2020, Mark? Because we just lived through May and June of 2020. So Cal Berkeley does a study. There's no racial disparity in officer-involved shootings. After the George Floyd incident, when there's this incredible outrage, guess what? All of a sudden, they retract their own study and say, you know what? We think we got it wrong. But here's what they said that's very interesting. And again, I'm going to ask you for your thoughts on it. They, they said that a lot of times when statistic, statistical analysis is done, for instance, and I, these are made-up numbers, Mark, made-up numbers. Let's say in the state of California, the population is 35% African-American. And 60% of the fatal officer-involved shootings are African-American. They say, look, that's a disproportionate number. But what Berkeley actually did is they looked at who was likely to encounter law enforcement and used that as the benchmark. So the overall population wasn't the benchmark. The benchmark was people, how many, what is the racial makeup of in areas with high violent crime, what is the racial makeup and, and of the people that would be encountering law enforcement in those areas? 
And when they did that, they found out that there, it was actually right in line with with that makeup. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that well, well enough for you makes, to understand? It, it makes 100%, 100%. It's 100% sense. Look, the sad reality is that black males commit a disproportionate amount of crime in the United States as a whole. And again, it's a sad reality. Now, why that's the reality, we could talk about mm -hmm. social, sociological and environmental uh, reasons why, and maybe a good topic for another show, but that is reality. It's not disputable. And so it's like, why would the fire department respond to uh, a house that's not on fire? Mm -hmm. Law enforcement is going to go where the crime is. And if you're going to where the crime is, or they should be, if you're going to where the crime is being committed, then you're going to obviously come into contact with more crime committers than you would if you went to a neighborhood where crime is low. Right. It's just a reality. And when that happens, then enforcement contacts are going to occur. And yep. that's where those numbers come come. And I have some stats in the officer and law yeah. as well, but I want to so, go ahead. So, so let me, let, like, since I, I feel like I didn't do the best job and, and probably uh, because uh, let me just read a quote from this article. And again, this is, this is an article or a study that's edited by the, by a gentleman named Kenneth Watcher, U, U, UC Berkeley. Uh, and this was June of 2019. Here, here's the kind of part of it that I think speaks to the issue we're talking about, Mark. Using population as a benchmark makes the strong assumption that white and black civilians have equal exposure to situations that result in fatal officer-involved shootings. If there are racial differences in exposure to these situations, calculations of racial disparity based on population benchmarks will be misleading. Researchers have attempted to avoid this issue by using race-specific violent crime as a benchmark as the majority of fatal officer-involved shootings involved unarmed civilians. I'm sorry, <laughs> the majority of fatal officer-involved shootings involved armed civilians. Mm -hmm. When violent crime is used as a benchmark, anti-Black disparities in fatal officer-involved shootings disappear or even reverse. In essence, uh, benchmarking approaches test whether members from certain racial groups are sh shot more than we would expect relative to some benchmark. The, the issue is that conclusions regarding racial disparities depend more on the benchmark used, mm -hmm. population versus violent crime, than the data, the number of people fatally shot. So I, to me, when I read that, because I've always wondered, yeah, why is it that more of a certain group is being shot? And when I read that and they talk about the benchmark that's being used for comparison, that actually makes sense to me and I understand it. It makes it again, it makes total sense. We're starting from an equal playing field here, in other words, as far as it was why would law enforcement engage in, in, in any level the use of force, whether it's just a, a traffic stop or all the way to an officer involved shooting using deadly force? And I think that that explains why to bolster that and, and to dig a little bit deeper into a specific area. We hear all the time about unarmed black men. I mm -hmm. talked about this earlier in this episode about the just the countless number of unarmed black men who are, and I'll use the word said so many times, are murdered mm -hmm. by police every year. I want to quote, and I, some of this may overlap a little bit. It's very important. This is from the Wall Street Journal, June 3rd, 2020. And this is written by Heather McDonald, who's an absolute brilliant author and researcher. I'm just going to quote a little bit from her, from her article here. In 2019, police officers fatally shot 1,004 people, most of whom were armed or otherwise dangerous. African Americans were about a quarter of those killed by cops last year against 2019. 235 of the hundred of the 1,000 that were shot. A ratio that re remains stable since 2015. That share of black victims is less than what the black crime rate would predict. In yeah. other words, right. according to this, officers shot and killed fewer than the number of criminals represented by, by blacks in this country. 
it underrepresents. Since police shootings are a function of how often officers encounter armed and violent suspects. In 2018, the latest year for which such data has been published, African Americans made up 53% of known homicide offenders in the U.S. and commit about 60% of robberies, though they are 13% of the population. Now, again, I'm not happy about these numbers. Of course not. But they are facts, ladies and gentlemen. And when you look at these numbers, and again, this goes back, what, four, three years now, and there may be an updated study, but this is pretty, pretty darn good. This is where I'll end on this as far as this topic. The police fatally shot nine unarmed blacks and 19 unarmed whites in 2019, according to a Washington Post database, down from 38 and 32 respectively in 2015. Nine unarmed blacks in 2019. I'm going to say it again. Nine unarmed blacks were shot by law enforcement in the entire year of 2019. Now, I want you to juxtapose that, everyone listening, watching this, watching this podcast. Mm -hmm. We hear, you will hear endlessly on media outlets and social media and newspapers about the systemic murdering of unarmed black men. It's just a lie. It's not misleading. It's not somewhat enhanced or exaggerated. It's a lie that unarmed black men are killed at random and, and by, by law enforcement. It's just not true. Matter of fact, based on this study here, it's actually underrepresented based on the amount of violent crimes committed by that group. Mark, I think that that wraps it up. Hey, what uh, you'll hear the truth on Truth Nation. My advice to people, when you hear statistics about this, ask what the benchmark is and take into consideration what the chief and I just said, who's encountering law enforcement is more, more accurate a benchmark than the overall population. Mark, thanks again. And listeners, viewers, we'll see you all next time.